So we're continuing in our series on great stories from the book of Genesis. We've been eight weeks already in the book of Genesis, and we've seen how God created the world basically good. He cre- after he created everything, he kept saying, it is good, it is good. And then he created man and woman and said, it is very good. But yet as we look around, we recognize our world is damaged by evil. There's a lot of things that don't go the way God would have it go that provides peace and harmony and joy and fulfillment in the lives of one another as well as in creation itself and particularly in relationship with God. And so God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. He loved it so much. He loves you so much that he was not going to let it continue on its path of destruction Instead, he sought out ways to restore it for the better. And that's what we've been hearing in Genesis, that God is continually speaking of a way of restoration, a way of restoring things back to the way he intended in the creation story. Not only that, but also establishing that relationship with us once again and sends us out to bring light and to bring healing into our world that is darkened and damaged by evil. Today we open up our Bibles in the book of Genesis, and I invite you to do just that. Open your Bibles along with me as we meet again with Abraham. We're looking at Genesis chapter 22, and uh, if you didn't bring your Bible with you, please open one up that's around you there somewhere, or on your phone app, go ahead and pull up God's Word, because it is central for us here in all of our teaching And not just from the podium, but in our classes, the kids that are dismissed, they're studying God's word. Um, Even on Wednesday nights, we're breaking open God's word so that we can hear the voice of God speaking to us through his word. And I want that for your daily life as well. That you, as people of God, are guided and directed by his holy word that's been treasured through the history and brought forth to you so that you could have it and have it freely. And not only have it and sitting on your stand in your house or shelf, but you actually open it and read it and hear the voice of God speaking to you through his Holy Spirit, through his word. Today we see again, Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. To leave the land that he had known, that he had grown up with. Leave your family. Leave everything behind and go to where I'm going to show you. And so Abraham did that. And in the process of that, God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. And if you were here last week, you saw that we took a little bit look where Abraham started asking questions of God. You know, I've been following you for 25 years and I still don't have a child. And God says, I'm promising you it's going to happen. But Abraham and Sarah decided to take it into their own hands. And Sarah came up with a great idea. Abraham, since I'm not able to have a child, take my slave girl. Take take my attendant and have a child with her. Henceforth comes Ishmael. And so we hear this story where Abraham just knew just enough of the story that he thought, I'll take it into my own hands. God needs my help. God needs my wisdom, and I'll show him how it's done. And, of course, if you know the story, it's tragic how that story plays out because that wasn't God's plan. But yet God was honorable to Ishmael, and we see some of that direction happening even in our world today, the division of these two families of Isaac and Ishmael. If you go to the Middle East, this is where some of the things that we're facing and challenge and difficulty there historically has been going on for a long time. And that's why so much of it is about the land. But that's not what we're here about today, because when Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him again and promised him a son, promised him a son by his wife, Sarah. That even though she was unable to have a child, God was going to work a miracle in her life. Even though she was in her 90s, God was still going to make it happen, and he did. And if you know the story, you know that both Abraham and Sarah laughed when they first heard it. Now, Sarah actually denied laughing about it. But it's interesting, if you look at the word Isaac, the name actually means laughter, it's, it's, it's really interesting how that plays out. But it, everything went well for many years. Isaac, you know, sometimes we think of Isaac as this little child in this story. But I think historically, if we look, we see that God is true to his promise. And that Isaac was probably a little bit older in his 20s, maybe even 
in his 30s. God said in Genesis 17, I will establish my covenant with him, meaning Isaac, as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And so today, as we look at Genesis chapter 22, I hope you've gotten there by now, but we're going to stand in honor of God's word, if you're able. As we read it publicly here at New Life, we like to do that, to stand in honor of God's word. And I'm going to read 19 verses of Genesis chapter 22. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. So sometime later is what I just kind of gave you a little bit of the, the intro to what all that had been happening in the previous chapters. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, and I will tell you about. Verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. So that should tell you something right there. He's not a little kid. Okay, Abraham didn't carry it himself. He put this wood on his son. Okay. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abram built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This is the word of God. Go ahead and have a seat as we unpack this. One of the first things I want you to see is that Abraham believed God. As a parent, you can't help but read this story and go, what was Abraham thinking? Right? I mean, as a parent, I want you, Aaron, where's Aaron Casco? Can you even imagine your new child, right, or Grayson, or any of you whose children, where's Ben? Is Ben here today? Ben, probably about your age, maybe, perhaps, Isaac was, you know, in his teens, in his 20s, wasn't this little tiny infant. But I couldn't help but notice in verse 2, where he's, God is saying, take your son, your only son, whom you love and offer him. It's almost like, like God is quoting John 3.16 to me. It sounds very familiar. But Abraham believed God. Isn't it interesting Abraham didn't say a word to God like, what? <laughs> Did I get that right? <laughs> you said what? But this is your promised child. What are you saying to me? Imagine if he told Sarah. 
right? The, de- the text doesn't say if he told her or not. Presumably, he didn't because she'd have said, well, if he told you that, he surely hasn't told me. You're not doing nothing. <laughs> but instead, it just says, the next morning he got up. He got up, saddled his donkey, cut the wood, and headed out. One of the commentators I was reading, James Montgomery Boyce, said it this way. How could this problem be resolved? In other words, how, how, could, he, how could Abraham face this dilemma, face this challenge? He'd been invited into something, and now God was challenging him. There were only two ways. Abraham could have concluded that God was erratic, right? Wavering, one plan to another because he didn't know his own mind. But yet that had not been Abraham's experience. Don't forget, he's oh well over 100 years old. The long wait for the son had taught him better than that. Or Abraham could have concluded that, although he being finite and sinful was unable to see the resolution of the difficulty. Right? Think, weigh those words for yourself in your own life. Unable to see far ahead. God could nevertheless be trusted to have a resolution which he himself would certainly disclose in due time. This was the harder of the two solutions to accept. But Abraham's experience of God led in this direction. Abraham acted in a manner consistent with his knowledge of God. That is, he trusted him. Why didn't he say what? Because he knew the voice of God. He had lived it. He had walked with him for years. This was no strange voice from out of somewhere or nowhere. This was an intimate relationship that God had with Abraham, and that's why he didn't question him. He took a position that God can be trusted. And Hebrews plays that out for us when it says it this way. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. This is the writer of Hebrews who helps enlighten us. You know, we don't hear those kind of verbal commands from God today like Abraham received. But there are times in your life where things don't seem to be going the way you had hoped. There's chaos, there's confusion, there's misdirection, and some of it is a consequence of your own poor decisions. But let's not be naive. God does test us. Because in the arena of testing is where our faith gets stronger. If life was always smooth and you didn't face any challenges or difficulties, where would you be today when the challenges do come? No, the testing in your life is to make stronger your faith. You can trust God even in the midst of when it looks like things are going off the rails. We believe and we walk in obedience to his word. You know, God is always a God of invitation. He's at work all around us, and he's always inviting you. He's inviting you right now. He'll invite you tomorrow. He might invite you even this afternoon into something that he is doing. He's inviting you to trust him. But oftentimes with that invitation comes the challenge. Will you trust him? Because a lot of times it calls you to do a step of activity or action, change a belief, change a a behavior. And God says, this is what my word says. This is what my plan for you is. This is how you're going to find true life and joy and fulfillment if you follow this way. And that's the challenge. It's like so often we can say, like perhaps maybe maybe, uh, others have questioned the will of God. Like Satan said right at the beginning. Can you really trust God? If anybody ever tells you that a life of faith never costs you anything, they're a liar. They're a liar. Because God is saying it's going to cost you something. The life of faith in your walk every day, it costs you something. 
You know, so often we're free and easy to say, hey, God, let's present this as your life. And you're a walking with faith person. And you say, you know, God, we're working hard, and so I place my health in your hands. I place my finances in your hands. Protect me as I drive my car. We say all these things, but we put my kids. Can you put your kids on here? Right? Protect my kids. And what God says to us is, I want you to have so much trust and faith in me. Yes, these things are important to you, but I want you. I want you. And all that other stuff will be added. So as a Christ follower, God invites us over and over and over again. And the challenge is always, am I going to trust him? And am I going to be obedient? Am I going to follow his plan or mine? Are you playing, church? Are you just playing? Abraham wasn't. He was so committed and so trusting in the character of who God was over years of wrestling and confusion and difficulty that he was able to say, I don't know how this is going to work out. But here, I've been following Jesus a long time. and John, I don't know if I could do that with you. <laughs> ben. Sam, Tim, I would like to think I could. And maybe figuratively, we do. We give God our kids. You see, here Paul brings it out in Romans 1, 5 when he says this. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles. So this is Paul speaking. He's saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I have been given this authority to tell Gentiles, that's you guys, that's us, that's you listening online most likely, what God has done for them. So that they will believe the invitation and obey. They go together, bringing glory to his name. Because that's what this, this whole thing is about. We see uh, even Isaac's obedience, and that's on your outline on the back of the bulletin. I want you to fill these in because I'm hoping that you're taking notes so that it's not just filling your mind right now. You walk out and you're 90%, you'll forget by tomorrow. So take a note or two. Abraham fully intended to sacrifice Isaac as God had commanded him. Verse 6 says that he took the wood and the burnt, for the burnt offering. He placed it on his son. They probably hadn't gone very far when Isaac asked, where's the lamb? And as a parent, you can imagine the pain in Abraham's heart. How would he answer? And we've already read it. We already know how he's going to answer it. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. I don't know how we'll get there. I don't know how it's going to happen. But we can trust God. And I can't help but think that Isaac, who perhaps was in his 20s, had understood a lot of this in relationship and watching his father interact with God and watching his father make decisions that maybe were contrary to the current culture of the time, but out of obedience to God, Abraham made these decisions. Isaac watched it. You know how dads, your kids watch you? If you play guitar, your kids will probably pick it up. If you chop wood, they're going to want to help. If you fish... <laughs> They're going to want to follow, right? They follow us. They mimic us. So let them mimic the attitude and character of God in your life. Ask that question. God is inviting me into that relationship. Am I laying it out in front of my family? Take the stand. Stand firm. He's trustworthy. That's probably one of the best communication messages you can give to your kids your whole life. Then we see... And, and, and I singled you out earlier, Ben, because I was thinking about Isaac. If he was just this little boy, eight years old or whatever, and 
try to put yourself in the scene. Here's Abraham with the rope, starting to lasso this kid. I don't know about you, but I'd have been fighting. Right? I don't know what you're doing, Dad. This is weird. But I ain't going to lay on that altar. No way. But yet yeah, Isaac did. Ben, do you think I could strap you up and put you on an altar? I'm 61. Probably not. <laughs> he's, he's not sure if I'm fooling with him or not. You'd throw me down. I, I know you would, Ben. You're a strong kid, strong guy. And yet the Lord, through an angel, says, stop. Don't lay a hand on him. Now I know that you fear God. Now that line could be misunderstood. Now I know that you fear God. It's not what it means. It means you're obedient. Now that I know that you revere God and you're obedient to him even when it doesn't make sense. That's how obedient you are. And now we get to the, the, the part of the story that I'm so excited about. And I can't believe we're having communion today. And it's the wonder of the Lamb. It's the wonder of the Lamb. Verse 13 says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and there was a ram caught in the thicket. God was true to his promises. God would provide the sacrifice. And he did. Where'd that ram come from? Who knows? But God provided it. And so verse 14 says, Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And to this day, on the mountain, the Lord, it will be provided. There on Mount Moriah, it is said in that general area, is where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself was slaughtered on a cross for you. And God didn't spare him. Abraham's trust, Abraham's obedience is important. But don't let that be the only part of the story you pick up because far more important is God's provision of the sacrifice that God will provide. It's not dependent on your perfected performance. There is nothing you can do that would make God love you any more than he loves you right now, right here, right in this space and this moment. And there's nothing you could do that would make him love you any less. The price is already paid in full. Jesus, hanging on that cross, said, it is finished. There's nothing more to be done but to receive it, to receive it. Even the babies are being awakened by God's grace. Amen. The Bible says infants will shout praises. When the truth of God's word is being proclaimed. See, we live by promises, not by explanations in your life. Romans, again, Romans 8 or John, let's, let's go there first, because again, coming back to this whole idea of Jesus being provided, it was the next day when John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is that Lamb. Paul adds to it in Romans 8 when he says, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? What else do you stand in need of? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. That little voice that you hear sometimes, who are you that you think God would love you? That's trash. I know what you did last week. Don't be taking communion today. That's a lie. Because if it was based on our perfection, none of us would be able to take this today. 
And that's the thing about Abraham and Sarah, and you should hear this, because they didn't do everything right. They didn't do everything perfect, but yet God still says it was counted as righteousness to them. And the same is true for you. As a Christ follower, we come stumbling, limping sometimes to the table of the Lord, but it's not based on your perfection. It's not based, it's all based on the cross of Christ, that he completely paid for your sin. And so he, he invites us. He says, come, come to the table. The Lord provides the sacrificial lamb so that his people will live. He wants you to live an abundant life here today. If you turn to him in faith, he will fulfill the promises that he makes to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our righteousness. That's why Paul can remind us as we prepare to take communion in Ephesians 3. He wraps it up for us and ties it with a bow. Now all glory to God who's able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church. And in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so we give thanks to God for this memorial meal that Jesus instituted with his disciples. And we have proclaimed on the front of it, do this in remembrance of me, the sacrificial lamb. I am your righteousness. He's not asking us to remember the horrible death that he experienced, although it's appropriate to do that. Instead, he wants you to know his victory over death. And he wants you to live as a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to walk with your head high and not gravel in the ground. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks and broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we remember, let's rejoice. The invitation is an invitation to stand unblinkingly at the foot of the cross Examine our horizontal relationship with Jesus Christ, the invitation that he gives us and how we live that out on the horizontal way of obedience to him. And maybe that act of obedience today is taking communion. I don't know where you are in your walk. I don't know where you are in your understanding of who God is. Maybe your prayer today is a simple one. God, I hear you, or I sense I hear you. I remember a young girl sitting here talking about how she was sensing something or feeling something like God was just speaking love to her. And she goes, is that God? <laughs> you bet it is. Because that's what he speaks. He's love. Why does God tell us this story? Why is it recorded? Why is it so historical? Because Jesus died on that mountain, on that cross, and he was the substitute lamb of God. Let me offer a prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity now to partake in communion. After your word was proclaimed, and what an amazing journey for us here today to get to this space as we recognize the new covenant in your blood, Lord Jesus, that our sins have been completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he finished on the cross once and for all. And that he declares to us that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his very body now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. And so as we take of this meal, we rejoice. In Jesus' name we pray.